I'm going to take this off since. Is that going? Yep. Okay, I did have a jacket to be professional, but that has not worked. My name is Peter Head. It's raining outside, so it's okay we're inside. If you have to be here on a Saturday, you might as well have your friends and family be in the rain, right? How many of you just spent four hours of here or in an earlier class? Well, I don't want to um, be anything but clear with you. The only reason we're here on a Saturday to do this is not the, the quest of higher education. It's not to make the community better. It's to make money. Right? It's that simple. Yes. And I'm older than most of you, if not all of you, and you've all known that story in the movie Wall Street. You know, greed's good. So we're here to help you make money. Okay? Um, I teach at Florida Atlantic University as well. I do that full time. There I teach in the School of Urban Regional Planning where I got to talk about the nice stuff, about building a community and social justice and let's get everyone together. Nah. <laughs> if I upset you with anything I say from a politically incorrect point of view, just go back to the barometer. We didn't make money. If you want to do something nice, you can go to church, temple, mosque, and do your nice stuff else. We didn't make money. But the most important thing is, what are we all going to do tomorrow? Who are we going to call? Mom. Oh, you can be nice to mom, even though we're here to make money. Don't forget tomorrow's Mother's Day. Um, I have taught this class twice before. And I taught it always on a Thursday evening, where I had a smaller class, once about eight, once about maybe 15. And that's when they work all day long, and then they rushed to get here through traffic, and they were brain dead. And I remember one time, we had to go from 6 o'clock to 10 o'clock. And it was about 9.20, I'm looking out at the audience. And I, they weren't on drugs, but they should have been, because their eyes were all, you know, and I was that way. So I said, you know what, we're going to go home tonight at 9.30. And I let him go after three and a half hours, not the full four hours. I got a phone call the next morning. <clears throat> it sounds like you let your class go a half an hour early. Fred, I'm sorry. They were, they were brain dead. I had it. Well, you know, it's important that you keep them for the full four hours. Yes, sir. <laughs> so I'm going to keep you until 4.30. Okay? We're going to learn skills that are going to be critical for what you're going to do. I thought that story had a happy ending. <laughs> no, that, it, it doesn't. That doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't, yeah. Now, the one executive decision I'm going to make, and I'm a little bit this, I'm going to give you a break. Now, what I wanted to do is I wanted to get closer to like the 55, 60%, then give you the break. Unfortunately, Starbucks closes, not Starbucks, um, my Einstein's closes at 2. So we're going to go to about 145, 150. So then you can get in there, get your last drink coffee. Can it be your job today to let me know when it's 145? Okay. Don't, because I'll keep going. I can talk as a former lawyer who charges by the word. I can go. <laughs> um, I wasn't always a stand-up comedian like this. You probably hang your jacket over there on the uh, projector. I'm going to put it where I don't forget it. That's the problem. Put it right here. I'm trying to figure out what I want to do when I grow up. I've been teaching at Florida Atlantic University um, in the School of Urban and Regional Planning for about four years full time. Before that, as an adjunct, I've taught here. This is my third class. Before that, I was a real estate developer in Fort Lauderdale. 
and then before that I was a real estate developer in Miami, and then I was a real estate developer where I ran a public trading company throughout the United States developing and before that I was a land use lawyer at the largest law firm here in um, Florida, Greenberg Firm. So I learned at the very early stages about land use law. Um, and you really can't get a master's in real estate development if you don't understand the land use approval process. Okay? At the end of the day, every component of what we do here in this program is critical. You need to know cap rates. You need to know discounted cash flows. You need to know marketing strategies. You need to know good construction. But guess what? I don't want to say my stuff is any more important than their stuff. But this is one thing I do know. If you don't have your land use approvals, all that other stuff doesn't matter. Now, um, ladies, I got some bad news. I'm married. <laughs> and the reason I tell you this, this is Fort Lauderdale. Guys, I'm married. <laughs> my daughter, when my daughter was young, my daughter got a sense that we were pretty well off. You know, we went on family cruises where she had her own butler. And then when we went to the first Dolphin game back when Marina was there, they were doing good, we went to Skyboxes. So she had a sense that, oh, life's good. So she says, Daddy, what do you do for a living? It's like this young. I said, well, honey, Daddy counts to three. She goes, oh, Daddy, I can count to three. Can I come to work with you? Sure, honey. Does anyone know what it means, I count the three? When I went to Boston University, I took a class in calculus. I did calculus one, I did calculus two, I did matrix theories, did all that fancy stuff. I made millions of dollars for myself and tens and hundreds of millions for clients, counting the three. And every once in a while, I got to count the four. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Take before you speak. There's five politicians on the city of Fort Lauderdale City Commission. Okay? I need three out of the five. Guess what? Three out of the five, I make millions of dollars. That's a 60% level. Three out of the five, sixty percent on your final exam, final project, you fail. It's a very low standard. I just got to get three out of five. And every once in a while, when I have to go to the county commission where there's seven, then I got to get four out of the seven. So everything I'm going to teach you over the next eight weeks boils down to: can you count to three? Can you count to four? That's really what I do. And however you can get there, this side of legality is what you have to do. Okay? Because at the end of the day, if you don't get your three votes or four votes, no matter how much analysis you've done where the market supports your project, where your pro forma is just oozing money everywhere, all of the other stuff they teach you here in the program means nothing if you don't have any three out of four votes. Okay? Everyone get that? It's that simple. Now, when I started as a land use lawyer a long, long, long time ago, before the thing called the internet, before the thing that communities activated together to fight developers, that was back in the days of smoke-filled rooms. You'd cut your deal in secret, and then you would get it approved. Um, and it was based on property rights. If you own the property, chances are you could do what you want. And if you had the politicians lined up, you could do what you want. OK? 
fast forward 25 years, everything's in the open. Everything is transparent. Okay? You actually have to work with your neighbors now. We're going to talk about a project that I was involved with that I did in Fort Lauderdale many years ago where the neighbors started with no way in hell are you ever going to get that approved in my town. And we're going to stop and fight you every step along the way. Fast forward three years after that, when we got to the public hearing, and I'm a land use lawyer, and I had three of the land use lawyers with me, we sat down. I had that neighbor who wanted to stop me come to the public meeting to be the first person to support a project. Okay? It's a collective process today. Okay? You can't do this in a vacuum. And the reason the second book that we're going to use, it's all about relationships. It's all about how they get to yes. Harvard and MIT about 25 years ago did, I think it's called the Project on Negotiation, but they have a think tank of where they took the best people on how to get to yes. Okay? That's the framework for this book. Okay? And the best way to get to yes is to work with people. And I started my career very arrogantly. You know, when I was at Greenberg Chart, I said, well, we're the biggest, we're the best, we're the brightest, we have the biggest clients, it's our land, we're going to do what we want, we're going to pound it through. And then I realized that's like trying to swim upstream. Why fight it? It's better to work with the community. Okay? So the main purpose of this class is to expose you to land use regulations, I don't need you to memorize a single land use regulations. Guess what? You can find them on your iPhone. It's all out there. Okay? But I need to train your mind to see legal issues. So then you can go find the law. I mean, I'm a lawyer. I don't know what the law. But I have it on my fingertips. When I, I felt a little bit silly one time, I used to work at Greenberg Charter. They had a beautiful building down on Brick Lab and it had the biggest law library south of Atlanta. It was beautiful. We'd watch the sunrise. The reason we watched the sunrise when you're a law firm associate, you don't go home. So you're still working and the sun's coming up. But it was a beautiful um, law library. And then 25 years later, they decided to move from Brickell to downtown Miami. No longer working for them. They're actually one of the law firms that I used as a lawyer. And they invited me down for a tour of the new building. So I said to them, wow, this is really beautiful. So where's your law library? They looked at me, what? You don't have those anymore. Here's your law library. Here, everything you need to know about the law, it's out there. We don't need to have a you know, 20,000 square foot law library anymore. So over the next eight weeks, the goal is to have you spot issues understand that, hey, I think that's a legal issue, okay? I gotta look into that. It's not the memorized law. The first book we're gonna use, though, is written by a lawyer who's also a urban planner, and this is basically a good how-to book on zoning. I purposely don't have us go into this book until we three and four. This way you have plenty of time to get the book. I think it's available on Amazon. I think it's at the Nova Bookstore. It's been around for a while. Now this book is written for one purpose. Ready? How to create and preserve property value through the land use process. Okay? It's a very good, easy read. You could probably sit down over two or three evenings and read the entire book. It's an easy read. You need to know every concept in this book. Okay? So this is critical. Okay? We're going to go through this. And then this book, like I said, is more how to work on relationships. Let me give you 
um, a good analogy of where we're going with this book. And I should have brought it with me. I have it in my office. It's a plastic lemon. Okay? Make believe this is the plastic lemon. There's only one of them. I want it, and you want it. Okay? So what do we do in America when somebody wants something? We sue over it, right? Okay? I want the lemon, you want the lemon, we're not willing to compromise. Okay? And then we pay lawyers a lot of money, we wait a lot of time, two years later, we finally get our day in court. It's you and me. We actually see each other for the second time. We saw each other for the first time when we thought about it. We've been paying lawyers a lot. Now it's right outside the courtroom. We each get there 10 minutes early. Okay. So I say to you, well, why did you want the lemon so bad? What does he say? I'm not telling you go first. Well, why did you want it? And I said to him, please don't laugh at me. I actually like to bake. And I wanted to make, since it's Mother's Day tomorrow, I wanted to make a lemon meringue pot. And the recipe called for one lemon. So I couldn't take half of a lemon. He starts laughing in my face. I think in, I'm thinking he's laughing because I'm a baker. He keeps laughing louder and louder. And he says to me, Gee, I wish you told me that story two years ago. We could have saved tens of thousands of dollars in legal fees. He's actually a full-blown alcoholic. He wanted the lemon peel on the outside for his martini. <laughs> if we communicated, we would have realized, wow, there was common ground. And it gets back to the difference between people fighting over their position and then fighting over their interests. His position was he needed the whole lemon. My position was I needed the whole lemon. The interests were I only needed the inside and he needed the outside, a lack of communication. That's what this is about. Now let me try to take that abstract and make it more realistic. I own a piece of property. It's legally permitted to put a 12-story high-rise building there. There's a high-rise building to the left, there's one to the right, there's one to the back of me. It's my property. I want to do exactly what's around the community. Turns out the neighbors come to fight me at the public hearing to try to stop me from developing my property. And I say to him this time, I learned by the lemon example, why are you fighting me? Don't you like my building? It's like the other one, but it's only better. I got a great architect. We, used, we went to Vancouver. We actually studied how they did the pencil buildings that are tall and thin. We made a great building. What don't you like about my building? And he says to me, I love your building. It's the prettiest building around. It's going to make my unit more valuable. The problem is, I've been trespassing on your property for 20 years, walking Fifi, my dog, across your property to get to the community park. And if you build your building, I can't get Fifi to the park anymore. And I gotta go all the way around, down and around, and it's unsafe. So I'm gonna fight you because I love my little feet and I want to walk. Well gee, how about I take an easement on the side of my property, eight feet, and I pave it nice, we put light and make it safe, and I'll make that be a community benefit that I give. Would that be happy? We didn't then support my project. Yeah, I would. Gee, do I want to give up eight feet? No. Would I rather give up eight feet and not fight you for three years in the courtroom? Yes. So the goal is you need to reach out to people, to find out not what their position is, but their true interest is. Because if you don't, 
you're never going to be able to take that pro forma that they're going to teach you how to run and how to make all that money because it's never going to happen. Of course, two votes don't get you what you want. Okay, so the whole framework of this class is to have you understand it's a very political process. Okay, and I know that Nova Southeast University has many, many departments and colleges, and somewhere they probably teach you about psychology. You know, people, how people are. And I don't want to tread on their territory, but the way I look at people, most people are selfish. And tying this into land use, it's called NIMBY. Not in my backyard. That's how most people are. I'm going to give you a final exam. And if I come back in and I start lecturing 10, 15 minutes on how good most people did, but some people didn't do that well, and I'm really happy patting myself on the back because it looks like I taught you well, and you're listening to me rambling on, you don't want to hear that. All you want to know is what grade did you get? Right? Most of us are pretty bottom line. Not in my backyard. Okay? Most people, that's how it boils down to. Let's talk about South Florida. My wife is the only person I know who can have navigation in the car where she hits a button to get her home and she still gets lost. Okay? <laughs> but if, and we actually live very east where you can't go anymore because it's the ocean. And you can't go west anymore because it's the Everglades. And there's no more land left. Therefore, the American dream of the single family house, it's not going to happen for the next generation. There's no land left. So we have to start building up and up and up. The new American dream is not that 2,500 square foot on a quarter acre in the backyard with a white picket fence, the minivan, and the basketball court. It's, hey, I'm on the seventh floor of a two bedroom, two bath. And it's affordable. It only costs me 800000 we all know there's affordable housing issues in Florida. Very hard to find a good place to live. And I can tell you as an urban regional planner, I'm actually an expert. After my name, I have the initials AICP, American Institute of Certified Planners. And I can tell you from a planning point of view, high-rise, multi-family, affordable housing, mixed income is a good thing to have good for the community. And if we can put that near transit, where people then can walk to tri-rail, so they don't need to have a car or a second car, that's a good thing. So I can come up with all this good community stuff. And I go to the community, you know what they're going to say? That sounds great, but not my background. Okay? That's the biggest problem you're going to have. But I used to serve on the Fort Lauderdale Affordable Housing Advisory Committee. I was actually the chairperson for five years. I was actually trying to help in Fort Lauderdale bring affordable housing there. I did it for a couple of reasons. One, it's what you have to do if you're playing the political developer game. Two, I felt God has blessed me, therefore I should probably give back. Um, but it was also the right thing to do. And the saddest thing was, they said to me, yeah, we need about 5,000 affordable housing units a year. At best, maybe 500 will come to market. So go ahead and do your committee, but you're never going to solve the problem. And every time I came up with a solution, good people, good moral people would vote it down. Because they don't want to see it. You know? They're going to give their mom a big hug and flowers tomorrow. They're going to write a check to their favorite religious thing and charity. So they'll do all these good things. But the minute you change their backyard, no, not my backyard. So that's the issue you deal with. And you have to deal with people with highest level of respect. You just can't come to town and say, we own the land, 
legally we can do this, we're going to do this. Because you know what? For about $300, they could file a lawsuit and slow you down for a year. And guess what? You might miss the market. Okay? And if you miss the market, as they teach you about real estate cycles here, you're out. In fact, many times, the other side, especially environmental litigation, they know they're not going to win. But if they can slow the project down and you lose your financing, or you lose um, your option on the property, that's how they win. So it's a battle. Okay? In fact, there's a book I use in another class called In the Wars. It's truly a war. But what I'm going to try to teach you is really that kind of gentle approach. Because at the end of the day, the best plans, ready? I lick both thumbs. <laughs> the best plans have as many thumbprints on it as possible. And this is how I know I'm good at my job. I'm going to say this very slow. You don't need to take notes. This needs to become part of your DNA. Ready? It's no longer my plan. It's our plan. Now, when I get to that public hearing, after a long time going through the process, I need the community to feel that it's our plan that's being approved. Okay? That's a big picture overview of where this is. I'm not going to teach you finance. I'm not going to do pro formas. I'm not going to do marketing studies. All of the technical, technical stuff that you get elsewhere, you get elsewhere throughout this program. I am very focused. And my attitude is this. I'm going to make the assumption every other discipline that you have here, you check the box, your project's ready to go, but you need your approvals. Okay? And you need those approvals. Now, there's a game that gets played. Um, and there's no sense trying to be the different developer, the nice guy. Because this you can also put in your DNA. Ready? Every good deed goes punished. If you go to the community and say the following, guess what? I'm the good developer. And I only need 10 stories to make my pro forma work. And I know that most developers come in, ask for 16, and they play the game and they get beat up and they end up at 10. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to come to you on day one telling you I need 10. Guess what? The neighbors start at 10 to get you down to 4. <laughs> so you have to go through the game, and usually the game is the following. I need 36 stories. I need 2,000 units to barely make my pro forma work. And if you take the 36 stories down to 35, and you take the 2,000 units down to 1,995, the deal doesn't work. I need it all. I can't negotiate. We've already done it. A year later, you're there with your community. It's our plan. And you're down to 21 stories. You're down to 1,200 units. And you act like it's great. And you are laughing because you know you just made a fortune. Unfortunately, there's a certain gamesmanship that has to be done. And they expect that. You know, it's like when you buy a car. You know there has to be, you know, unfortunately that's part of the, I don't want to say the bad side of the process, but I've never seen a developer do well when he or she comes in and says, I'm just going to tell you what I need right off the bat. So you've got to feel it out. Now, I assume you've all been in a plane. But you know the analogy of a 40,000 foot level, and then a 20,000 foot level, you come down, and then a ground level. Everything starts with the comprehensive plan. Since we're in, I think technically we're in Dayton, but I'm a Fort Lauderdale kind of guy. Um, this is the Fort Lauderdale comprehensive plan. This is every piece of property in the city of Fort Lauderdale. Why did I say city of Fort Lauderdale? 
what all of you need to know, and don't be stupid, because if you get this wrong, you're stupid. You need to know, no, seriously, you need to know what jurisdiction you're in. I live, if I invite it over to my house, but I'm probably not, my mail-in address says Boca Raton, Florida. I don't live in the city of Boca Raton. I live in unincorporated Palm Beach County. So if I wanted to add on to my house, assuming I get a building permit, most people don't, but if I want to do it the right way and get a building permit, and I show up at the city of Boca Raton, they're going to throw me out. I have to go all the way up to West Palm Beach to the county. So the first thing you need to know is, where's your property? Okay? Are you in the city limits? If you drive by US-1, this red strip here, most people think this is Fort Lauderdale. That's Oakland Park. That's why it's white here. It doesn't, it's not part of the jurisdiction. So you always figure out, where are you? Okay. Then once you know whether it's a city or a county, the comprehensive plan. Now, urban planners are not the smartest people in the world. They can't do calculus. So they make it real easy. And whether you're in China, Oak Raton, Fort Lauderdale, or Kansas, do you see the red? The red is commercial. Okay? The red is always commercial. You see US-1? That's why there's a red strip on commercial corridor there. And you see the lines going like that, going to 995, that is always commercial, red. Yellow is always residential. Okay, they make it real easy. So you always start with the future land use map. Because if you get a piece of property that's currently vacant today, and you want to develop that property, the question is, what can you do with that property? Start at the comprehensive plan, the 40,000 foot level. And it'll tell you. Okay? Now, a bright yellow usually means it's like residential, three units per acre. You know, like mustard, the bright yellow. And then as it goes from that to like the golden's mustard color gets a little bit more goldenish to it, that's a higher density. That might be 8 to 12 units per acre. And then when you get almost to the highest density in Fort Lauderdale, which is 60 units per acre, they use a brownish yellow. It's more brown than yellow. Okay? But the point is, all of you need to know without even thinking about it, if I see red, it's commercial. I see yellow, it's residential. Start with the comprehensive plan. Now, the beauty of it is, you can be sitting on the beach, you could take out your iPhone, and you could probably find this for every major jurisdiction there is where you'd ever want to develop. GIS, um, Geographic Information Systems, put online all this stuff. They don't hide this anymore. Okay? But this is what you'll always do. So if you're looking at a piece of property for one of the projects here at Nova, or when you get out and do your job, first thing, what is the comprehensive plan land use designation? That's the 40,000 foot. Then moving down from the 40,000 foot, like a 20,000 foot, is a zoning code and a zoning map. This is also Fort Lauderdale. Every piece of property in Fort Lauderdale is on this map. Okay? If it shows yellow there, it has to be a residential zoning classification here. Because this is the first piece of law that I'm going to teach you today. In Florida, and if this was a law school next door, and I was teaching a class to the lawyers, 
they would be going to Florida Statutes, Chapter 163. I would say download it. We're going to go through that. We're not going to go through the statute. But in Florida, the comprehensive plan must be consistent to the zoning. If you have a yellow color on your comprehensive plan map, which means residential, it would be illegal in Florida to then have a business zone in here because it's not consistent. You know? Everyone get that? They have to line up. Comp plan, zoning have to be the same. And the standard is called consistency. Now to take that argument even further, what you care about is called your development approval. That's your approval from the government that you can do it. That too has to be consistent with zoning, which has to be consistent with the comprehensive plan. It's like getting the planets to line up, the moon, the sun, and earth in a perfect line. Your government approval for your project if it's commercial, then it has to have a commercial zoning, and it has to have the red color there. Okay, if any of them are out of line, it's not allowed, it's illegal. And we'll get that, that's pretty fundamental. And I said in Florida, but that's pretty common throughout. But Florida's going to make it really clear that it would be illegal not to have that. So that's why, if you're going to leave Nova, you're going to go into real estate development, you're going to buy and sell properties. Every piece of property that you ever touch, you always ask yourself, is it in a city or a county? What rules do I have to follow? What's the comprehensive plan designation? What is the zoning? Because guess what? Your lender is not going to loan you money to develop if you don't have these things lined up. Okay. Now, the detail is greater on a zoning map than on a comprehensive plan. They might take a big 40-acre track on a comprehensive plan, paint it yellow, and all you know is residential. But then you go to the zoning map to figure out, well, what's the detail? The lowest level of residential in Fort Lauderdale, I believe, is R S three. Again, they make it real basic: R for residential, S for single family, three for what? Not acres. It's three dwelling units per acre. So those are one third area lots. Then it might be RS5. RS5. Then you get 5. Yes? So you have RS5. Can you use the S for single family? You can do townhouses or something like that? Well, you have to, and I'm glad you raised this question. Um, the most important thing always to do is read the definition. A single family home, all of us might be thinking a single family home is a detached single family house where you have grass all around you. But if the zoning code says single family could also be townhomes or duplexes attached as long as there's nothing above you, then it would still be allowed. Always, always, always read the code. Okay? As you, yes. Why uh, municipalities and counties don't have a standard on the way they have their building permit schedules and impact fee schedules? Well, you have to realize this. Um, the question was, why don't they have a standard framework? Every community is different. Has anyone been to Golden Beach? That's in Miami-Dade County in the um, upper northeast quadrant on the beach. It's, it's right above Sunny Isles. I used to develop in Sunny Isles. Now, 
to answer your question of why they don't have it the same, the comprehensive plan is the community's vision of what that community wants. If you go to Golden Beach tomorrow, take mom for a car, you're going to see one and two story estate homes. It's a very small area, but it's estate homes, single family. It's not a very big area. And as you go from the county line, Broward Miami Dade County line, through Golden Beach, it's about a half mile, maybe a little bit more. Then you hit what I call paradise. Sunny Isles Beach. It's a developer's nirvana. It's heaven. And you go through Golden Beach, two-story beautiful homes, and like flipping a switch on or off, 55-story condo towers just come right out of the sky. Okay? So you ask, well, why don't we have a uniform code? Well, the community vision for Golden Beach is we want to live in a small little estate hamlet. Sunny Isles said, well, most of our people are people from the upper northeast, New York, Boston, Chicago, that are used to high-rise living, and that's what we want here. Okay? I used to develop with the Trump group in um, Sunny Isles, and to me, it's the most pro-developer town. In fact, the only way they could have made it easier for us is if they said, no, stay in your office. We're going to have the mayor hand deliver the building permit to you. It was almost that pro-developer. And the beauty of it is, if you don't want only 50 stories, you want to do 55, you could buy the right to do another five. Each town has their own vision, okay? So that's why there's no uniform. I was up in the town of Palm Beach the other day. The town of Palm Beach would never, ever accept using the same zoning code that the city of West Palm Beach would use. Okay. So as you go through this, though, and it gets down to this, local government cares about their police department, their fire department, and their building zoning department, because that's what their community is at that point. Okay? As you move through this, the RS35, then you'd probably move to a RM, R still residential, M means multifamily, but then it might be 6, 8, or 10, or 12, and then you can move to my favorite, RH60. R is residential, H is high rise, 60 is 60 dwelling units per acre. That's the stuff that I love. Okay? But what you need to realize is it all starts with the comprehensive plan. Okay, so the plane was at the 40,000 foot level with the comp plan. It came down to the 20,000 foot level with the zoning code. Then I come along, now let me make a comment to you. The government prepares the comprehensive plan. The government prepares the zoning map. And then they just sit back and they wait. And they say, okay, we put a designation of what we want. We zone the property for this. Now we hope a developer comes along that wants to develop. A developer has to prepare what's known as a site plan. It's the most important document you're ever going to prepare that has to go through the government approval process. This happens to be a site plan that I did in North Carolina. And just to show you, yellow is residential in North Carolina just like it's yellow in here. And the red down here is the commercial. Okay. And if you notice, the single family yellow is lighter 
and then it got a little bit more golden to where the multifamily was. Okay? The point is, I as a property owner who have property, have a professional land planner, landscape architect, engineer, prepare a site plan, okay? that has to be consistent with zoning, consistent with the comprehensive plan, okay? And this is what I go to the public hearing to get approved, okay? And this is where it's either a non-event that gets approved in five minutes, or this is where you bring a sleeping bag because it's gonna be a long night because there's 250 people waiting to sign up to speak against your project. Now, I'm not proud of this, but remember I said NIMBY wars? The city of Fort Lauderdale does not have a very big city commission chamber. Maybe it's five times the size of this. Do you know how easy it is to get $50 to a college student and a certificate to go out for dinner afterwards, to show up at 6 o'clock for a 6.30 meeting and just sit in the first 10 rows. So then when the people who want to fight me show up and there's no room and now they're forced by the fire marshal to go upstairs and watch them on a certain TV. <laughs> It's a war out there. Mm -hmm. Statue of limitations are run. But I've shown up where, imagine this. Picture of my project on a t-shirt with a big red line through it. Because the Century Village bus showed up and everyone's great-grandmother just got off. They don't want it. In fact, I'll give you a perfect example. If you come down I-95 through Palm Beach County and you enter Broward County and you get off in Deerfield Beach on Southwest 10th Street and you go west, it's on the ground for about three miles and then it bleeds right into the Swordgrass Expressway. And then Swordgrass Expressway takes you on the loop down to I-75. And you don't need to be a traffic engineer to say, gee, we must have pretty dumb traffic planners in Florida. Why wouldn't you take the Swordgrass Expressway that starts in I-75 by 595, take it as an elevated highway, and bring it right into I-95 so you can go seamlessly without local ground traffic lights. That's good regional planning, right? They're actually trying to do that. Well, they are now, but when they started that, you had, look, I don't want to sound like Trump making fun of Senator McCain, but the reality of it is, 25, 30 years ago, the people who lived in Century Village who actually had the voting booth in their clubhouse, so they voted, basically said to the politicians, we will vote you out of office if you make it a high rise right in our backyard. We don't want it. So for 25 years, all of us, especially the transportation network for commercial, had an inefficient system because one community that was politically active said not in my backyard. And they basically had to quote unquote die off. It had to get so bad and new people had to come in because now there was expectation room and it was eventually going to happen. And finally, we're now going to connect I-95 to the short rest. And what had to happen was 10 years of backup. Because I knew every time I left Palm Beach County to go to Fort Lauderdale, right around Southwest 10th, it was the, are we going to let one little subdivision of people who probably can't see or hear it anyway stop? And we did, because of politics. 
Because remember, I said I need three or four votes? Well, they also are counting votes as well. And that's what it gets down to. You know, I serve on the board of my condominium, and I've gone, I'm the president, we're going through a major renovation, and I go into board meetings sometime, and I say the following, okay, I got the votes I need to do what I want. I'll give you your three minutes, because the Florida statute says I have to have this be an open discussion. I hit my iPhone, you have your three minutes talk and complain, I'm going to tell you when your three minutes are up, then I got the three votes, we're going to vote yes and move on. It's all about getting votes. I need votes to get my project approved. They are counting votes to stop it. Now this is the difference. Remember I said you don't need no any law, it's all out there in the phone book, and you can go find it? This is the difference. Make believe this is all of the law that you have to follow on the federal, regional, county, local, state level to get your project approved. You as a developer have to be 100% perfect with that. The other side, all they have to do is show up at a public meeting and say, guess what? Page 85, they did it do correctly. Got to start all over again. Okay? That's all the other side has to do. And we're going to talk about this later. It's called notice. You have to send mail notice out to adjacent property owners when you are doing a rezoning or site plan approval. Now, I am, I don't want to say anal retentive, but I'm anal retentive. I'm a lawyer. I can't help it. The code is going to say the following. It's going to say, you shall. It's not going to say, we suggest. It's going to say, you shall mail be a certified mail, return receipt requested, notice to all property owners within 300 feet of your property, telling them about the public hearing for your site plan approval. 299 feet is not 300 feet. And if the other side can show up and prove that you mailed notice only out 299 feet, you got to sell all over again. That's why you hire professionals who do the GIS, who go to not where your building is in the middle of the property, who go to your property corners, do the circle 300 feet, and maybe add another foot just to be sure, then make sure they mail it to everyone and they give it out the data. Because the code says 300, you have to have 300. Okay? What we're not going to talk about in this class is what happens after these three big things. Comprehensive plan, zone and map, and then your site plan approval. The site plan approval is the political thing that you can do. But after that, you can't start making money yet. There's other things you have to do, which I'm not going to go into in detail, but I want to at least mention. You might have to do a subdivision plan or a plat that lays out the lots very specifically. If you live in a subdivision in South Florida where your neighbors all around look like exactly the same house you're in, in your lot 17, there's probably a plat, it's a legal document, that a surveyor prepared that shows every lot, every curb, every water track, and, okay? And that's how then you convey property. That's what engineers do. By the time I get my site plan approved, that's not a battle anymore. The battle's over. That's just cleanup. That's what engineers do. Then after that, you got to hire an architect to go get a building permit to actually go vertical. We're not going to talk about that. I know you might do some construction stuff here in the program. That's good. We're not going to focus on that. But the magic ticket before you can start putting the green money in your pocket, you need a certificate of occupancy, or CO. That's all I care about. 
because the government says you can't start selling units or renting space to the public until you get a CO. The CO is the final magic thing at the very end. That's when you can start printing money through the real estate development process. What we do in land use regulation is more the front end. It's not the technical stuff later on. Okay? <clears throat> I wanted to hand out the syllabus, pages four and five. I think I have enough. I'm going to have you pass them around. And I think I'm going to make a change to the syllabus. The syllabus, I believe, is available online through the repository that we have for all the syllabi. Please read that, but for discussion purposes today, I wanted you to have in front of you Now one of the mistakes that I made, and it's truly a mistake, when I prepared a syllabus where I can sound very academic, syllabi, you know, sometimes that's how they call it. Um, when I prepared this, let me know if there's enough going around. I may not have gotten enough on each side. Everyone have a copy? When I prepared this, I assumed it was like the last two times I taught this class. One time I had eight people, one time I think it was 12. I think I'm going to have to change this slightly. And what I mean by that, please go to session seven. I am most likely going to have divide section seven between session six and seven. I look at it like this, I'm one person. I've been doing this for a while, I can teach you a lot. But you can also learn a lot from your classmates, okay? You can always learn. I take the PowerPoint presentation cast case studies very important. That's when you actually go do this stuff. If I try to have all of you do a presentation in week seven, we're either going to be here well through dinner, or it's going to be a three minute, okay, that's good, next person. So I'll give you the details next week on this, but assume I'm going to divide session six and seven where you present your projects. Which means session five is I'm probably going to do most of this book in session five, but I'll be giving you bits and pieces of it throughout weeks one through four so when we get to it, to actually do the aha moment, we'll be okay. The legal case in session five, I'll hit to today, so we don't need to worry about that. That's the one change of the syllabus that I'm going to have to do. I want to talk about your project. Oh, and then I want us to take a quick break right before 2 o'clock so then people can get some coffee before they close at 2, then we'll come back, and then we're going to go through a 90-minute PowerPoint, probably more than 90 minutes. Your project is you have to go find a project that's already been through the process. In Miami-Dade, Palm Beach Broward. You have to go figure out what was the comprehensive plan, what was the zoning, how did they get the project approved, how did they get to yes. Or maybe you pick a project that failed, did not get approved, and you say, well, this was controversy. Looks like the developer didn't take your class. He thought, the smoke-filled room, I'm going to pound it through work, and it didn't. Okay? So I want you to touch this stuff. Okay? And then, 
I want you to also report how could we have made the project bigger, better, by using some of the frameworks that we're going to go through in this class. But you need to feel comfortable digging into the government. Now, the one thing that I would do for any project, and let's assume you're not going to do anything that is buying a piece of dirt where you're going to do the development yourself. Let's assume you're just buying for investment purposes. And someone else already got it through the process. One thing you always want to get a copy of is the government staff report. Remember I told you I'm also an urban planner? I'm teaching you to leave here to go make money. When I teach planners, I'm teaching them how to build a better community, how to work for government. And what they do as government, I'm not going to call them bureaucrats because that's condescended, but as government employees, as urban planners for the government, they do staff reports. And their staff report is going to go through the analysis of the comprehensive plan. It's going to go through the analysis of the zoning. It's going to go through the site plan to see if it's consistent. And they're going to make sure it lines up. So if you're looking, now, there was a time I was looking at every piece of property on the water in South Florida. This is before the Great Recession. If it was a church, I was willing to buy it, knock it down, and put up a condo. Okay, God will deal with me later. The land was just too valuable. If, if anything, we went after a nursing home on the water. We went after oh, in Boynton Beach, Lake Worth. It was like, it was there for 40, 50 years. It was a Catholic seminary for nuns. And we bought them out. Okay? It was a waterfront. That was anything water you can build and make a fortune. Okay? The point is, if you are doing analysis, you're looking at multiple properties, you don't have time to, well, what is the comprehensive plan? What is the zoning? Go get the staff report. Very good chance another developer might have looked at it, might have tried to get a project approved, might not have had community support. You want to know that. You want to know what's already been done on the property. It's all public record. Whatever I look at, yes. And you would find it where? Well, this is what I'm telling you right now. Public record, but? Well, I'm, I'm telling you right now. <laughs> Every time, and again, I might use a lot of local Florida examples. You could pick up, leave here, go to Portland, Oregon, and what we teach you applies there. This is, you know, used everywhere. Every time I go to another jurisdiction, I call up local planning staff. The planning and zoning building. Fort Lauderdale, for years, called it the planning and zoning building. And then that wasn't sexy anymore, so now they call it the Department of Sustainability. It's still planning and zoning with a fancy name. I call them up and I say, hey, there's a piece of property at the intersection of Oak and Elm, whatever. I'm interested in that. Hey, has anyone ever filed an application on that before? Oh, let us check for you. Oh yeah, they did. They tried to put multifamily apartments there with a 10-story height thing, and the neighbors went ballistic. Oh, can I get a copy of the staff report? Sure, it's public record. This is where it is. You say, go get it. They work, each government's different. They might have it on microfilm, they might have it in a database, they might have paper files. The point of it is, every time you're looking at a piece of property, and you're doing your due diligence, I assume they're gonna teach you here about real estate contracts. Every real estate contract that I've done, when I'm the seller and I'm selling a piece of property, I'll sign a contract at 12 noon, and you know what? At 12.01, let me get the wire. I'm ready to get the money, right? If I'm the buyer, I'll sign a contract at 12 noon and give me a year to go get my site plan approved to remove all the risk. So I have no risk whatsoever. That's an allocation of risk among parties. But let's assume you agree, I'm going to give you a 90-day free look. You put up your good faith deposit, a million dollars. On day 91, if you haven't sent a letter to the escrow company or title company, that money is gone, quote, hard. You never get your million dollars back. 
Now you have 90 days to investigate this property. Should your company spend 15 million or not to buy it for a piece of dirt or an old warehouse you want to knock down? Imagine it was 25 years ago. And I said, hey, do you want to buy an old warehouse about two miles, three miles north of the core of um, downtown Miami? I would say, no. I'm going to get knifed if I go there. Why would I ever want to buy land there? Well, today, what's that called? Winwood. It's probably worth 50 times or whatever. Okay, but people buy properties, and you have to do your investigation. And your investigation always starts with, what city am I in? Am I in the city of Miami, or am I in the Miami Shores, or unincorporated Miami-Dade County? What is the comp plan? What is the zoning? Now let me tell you how land use lawyers make a fortune. Okay? And this is what I tell all my students. And let's assume you work for me and I'm the president of a big development company. And my goal is to make a fortune. You work for me as my real estate associates. And if you come to my office and with your head down and you say, well, you told me to go look at that property and I know you wanted to build something to make a lot of money, but you know what? We can't because it doesn't have the right comprehensive plan designation and it doesn't have the zoning that we need. Therefore, we can't do it. You better duck your head because I'm probably going to throw something at you. You come to my office with your head held high and you say, guess what? Here's my pro forma. We're going to make a fortune. But before we can make a fortune, I need you to sign this engagement letter with the big law firm down the street. We're going to pay them $300,000 minimum. And guess what? They have magic. You know that yellow on the land use map? They can make it red. Okay? And that's how we're going to make our fortune. Well, guess what they can do it even better? They can take green. Green is not good. Green's that environmental stuff. That's kind of like, they want to keep it that way. But if you can pay a law firm $300,000, and they can make green look red, and then you pay them another $200,000, then they'll make the zone consistent with that, wow, power start coming up. Those industrial warehouses that used to be, you'd get ninth, you'd get your kidney taken if you went down there 25 years ago. Now it's the hottest place around. That's what land use firms do. So the lesson is, never accept what the comprehensive plan says. Never accept what the zoning says. Figure out who has the ability to get you your three votes. And go get your three votes. Now, a good law firm will never say to you, yeah, I'll do that for $300,000. No, a good law firm is going to say, I'm billing at five fifty an hour. I need a $25,000 retainer, and I have no idea what it's going to cost. Because you don't know the opposition. Okay? So, don't ever accept what the government has done. Because things change. By nature, they're supposed to change. Okay? That's what land use attorneys do. And in certain towns, there's only a handful of engineers, site planners, and land use attorneys that can get it done. And if you leave Nova and you go work for a national REIT, Real Estate Investment Trust, that does properties throughout the United States, you could probably use Wall Street or big city financial people, because money's the same everywhere. Okay? And you could probably use national construction firms, because construction methods are the same everywhere. So those can be moved around. But when it gets down to a specific piece of property in a specific jurisdiction, this is going to sound arrogant. I'm probably one of the best land use lawyers around, at least the top five in Broward County, at least back when Jack Silent was the mayor. 
I can get things done. You know what? That doesn't help me in Miami-Dade County. It means nothing down there. And that's not going to help me in Oklahoma. So local engineers working, local land planners, local land use people, you've got to do local. Because guess what? They're the ones that go to the Thursday night cocktail parties. They're the ones that bundle the political checks and deliver them. You know? Let's talk about money for a moment. And then we'll take a quick coffee break. Remember I said, ladies, I have that daughter, that three-year-old daughter, now much older now? My daughter has written many, many, many checks to every elected official in Fort Lauderdale for $250. So is my son, so is my wife. If I could get my door to open and check an account, my door would write one as well. Now look, I'm going to say this very slow. It is 100% above board to write a $250 check to someone who wants to run for elected office in Fort Lauderdale. 251 is illegal. Given $250 cash to my secretary, then have my secretary write the check is illegal. Don't cross that line. Now the thing about it is, it's all public record. Now I and every other developer land use attorney was back in Bruce Roberts, who was the vice mayor for a long time, wanted to become the new mayor for Fort Lauderdale. And if you look at the list of everyone who wrote a check, it's a who's who. In fact, half their names are on the building out here. Every business person wrote a check for Bruce Roberts to be the next mayor of Fort Lauderdale. He's a good man. He truly is a good man. He used to be the police chief, and then he became, he put his time in. He lost to another good man, lawyer. He lost to Dean Trent Tellis for one reason. The community of Fort Lauderdale has a NIMBY mindset like everyone else. But you know what happened? Everything's come home to roost now. There's been so much development over the last two, three decades in Fort Lauderdale. All that infrastructure to support that can't support it anymore. And they're starting to have, every time it's a full moon, roads are flooded. And they're spending $50 billion in bonds to fix water and sewer. So the community basically said, stop. It's over. And a no-growth, anti-growth commission has taken over. So I do some work with Trip Scott, one of the big Republican gurus um, in Fort Lauderdale. And I basically said, gee, I guess for the next nine years we'd go to the beach. What are we going to do? You know, things go political. So um, I don't want you to make it look like it's a sleazy business. It's just how it is, you know? But don't ever cross the line. If the code says 250, don't give more. But it's a game that gets played. But the reason why you hire the local person, if you're in Atlanta and you work for a week and you want to do multifamily housing throughout the southeast, and you're doing it in Tampa, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm, Orlando, Jacksonville, Tallahassee, you don't have the time to be in each of those things. You don't have the time yourself to know who has the influence. That's why you hire local. Real estate is a local thing at that point. Okay? Yes? Uh, I guess in times of friction, politically speaking, and with um, not that much land left, is the need for a land use lawyer more important now, or is it sort of diminishing? Well, we can take a break, then I want to talk about that, because we're here in the 4.30, and I want to give people a chance to grab a cup of coffee, and they only have nine minutes left. So please come back at five minutes after two. I'm going to answer that question, and we're going to go through the PowerPoint. All right, Trey, can you just kill that um, oh, yes. thing, and we'll put it back on? Sure.